Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the 73rd Mogcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, in conversation with Jacob Rees Mogg in the very different surroundings of the Cabinet Office. For the last time I saw you, Jacob, you were still leaving the house. We were in your office um, in the main um, body of Parliament, and here we are. So I'm going to start with the most innocuous of questions. Tell us about your new job. Uh, thank you. Um, and it is funny because when we last met, I had no inkling that I was about to change offices. There was a little bit of newspaper gossip, but there's been new newspaper gossip uh, almost all the time I've been around. So here we are. And I've got a very interesting job because it is both Brexit opportunities, but also government efficiency. So it's at the heart of, I think, what so many Conservatives feel is important about government, but isn't always what government succeeds in doing. So what do we expect of government as Conservatives? We expect that the government is there to do things that need to be done, but no more, and should let people get on with their lives and get on with their businesses as far as is practical. But over the years, you build up endless barnacles on the ship of state. Um, you were joking as you came in that you were asked for your telephone number by the security team, which was apparently a track and trace issue. And once something starts, it's very difficult to get rid of it. The regulations come in, and then they're just there, and they don't get reviewed, they don't get thought about, and inefficiencies build up. It's sort of like lime scale in a kettle, if you wish, until eventually you have to get a new kettle. So my role, I suppose, is to be the anti-lime scale agent of government. Who was the anti-lime scale agent before you? Uh, well, I think there were two. I think that part of what I'm doing was previously done by Lord Agnew and part by Lord Frost. Though some of Lord Frost's role has gone off to the Foreign Secretary. So I, I picked up um, things that other people were doing, but not exclusively from one person. But if um, efficiencies were required in a department, um, it's now your job to make sure they're delivered, isn't it, even though you're not the Secretary of State in this imaginary department from which savings are required? It is a collaborative effort, uh, and um, there are a number of things that are important in making this work. First of all, that actually all ministers want their departments to be efficient. There isn't a minister around who's advocating inefficiency, um, and there is central support. So um, Agnew made a lot of headway. Uh, Lord Maud made a great deal of headway as well. So I'm following the footsteps of people who have done this job before and done it very effectively. This is your first job as a minister in a department, isn't it? You've been a backbencher, you've then been leader of the Commons for quite a while. Now at last, you're a minister with the power and authority to effect things. How do you feel about it? Well, I think the reality of power, as you put it, is that we are a collective system. It is cabinet government, and all ministers require the support and cooperation of other ministers and of the parliamentary party to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, but from my point of view, being given the Brexit opportunities brief is uh, my chance to do something I've made speeches about, I've theorised about for years, to see if I can put it into practice. And that's very exciting because uh, the whole point of politics is to try and get things changed for the better, to get things done properly, um, rather than simply making speeches about them. Just um, while we're on the subject of the um, cabinet office, I had a look this morning to see how many ministers it has in it. Do you know the answer off the top of your head? Well, it's got lots and not lots. That, that is to say, as leader of the house, I was technically in the cabinet office but I didn't have an office in the cabinet office. And the only thing I was asked to do for the cabinet office was to stand in on a Friday, um, uh, on private members bill day, uh, when there was some, they need a minister in case there's an urgent question. Uh, the leader of the Lords, likewise, the chairman of the Conservative Party, likewise, um, Nigel Adams, Minister Without Portfolio. So um, the, the um, 
people who are in the cabinet office doing cabinet office things are our Lord True, Heather Wheeler, uh, the Paymaster General, Michael Ellis, Chancellor Duchy of Lancaster, Steve Barclay, and me. You've jolly nearly got to all 13, because Alok Sharma's also there. And um, the Veterans Minister um, is uh, there, the MP for Aldershot, whose name temporarily is Leo Doherty. Um, so it's a lot of people. The reason I'm asking is I'm wondering um, if any of these people, including perhaps you, are going to be moved across into this new office of the Prime Minister that the Boris Johnson referred to in his statement um, when he was responding to the outline of the Sue Gray report. Well, the Chancellor of Duchy is effectively in the office of the Prime Minister. Um, but all, all, all these things are inevitably legally complex in terms of changing them and how you make sure that the legal reality follows the, um, uh, the, the construction of the government. So, so you have to have things in administrative order as well as in theoretical order. Um, why is the leader of the House of the two houses in the Cabinet Office? Well, because historically the Prime Minister was leader of the House, depending on which House uh, he was in. It's never been a she as Prime Minister and leader of the House. Um, and so therefore you become part of the Cabinet Office by accident, really, an historic quirk. So I imagine with the establishment of the Office of Prime Minister, some of this will be sorted out and formalised. You've got an opportunity now to deliver um, policies and ideals you have promoted. So it's said, naturally, you won't want to comment that in Cabinet, you suggested that the NI rise shouldn't go ahead and it could be funded by efficiency savings. Now, you won't comment on that, but I, I think from memory, the NI rise is going to raise, what, 12 billion a year. You'd be up to finding 12 billion pounds in efficiency savings, wouldn't you? The government property portfolio, which also comes under me, is worth 515 billion pounds. Well, what's 2% of that? It's 10 billion just over. Um, there are lots of amounts of money within the government system. The procurement uh, part of the Cabinet Office has, I think, saved £6 billion over the last year alone by bringing private sector discipline to procurement, by publicising pipelines earlier. Because the fascinating thing about little things, uh, uh, but because of r and I did a course run by the procurement department um, just before I left being leader of the house to see what is the good model for procurement in the hope that I could um, involve the House of Commons with this, uh, which is possible because they will do training for um, uh, um, other bodies that are within the state. Um, but simply by announcing the pipeline earlier, you mean lots of smaller companies who don't have a dedicated tendering department can get involved, and that means more people applying. It means possibly lower prices and savings. And uh, then the management of projects. The, the state had been pretty good at the tendering process, but had then been less good at managing the project once it was up and running. And they've saved £6 billion by bringing in some discipline. There, there, is, there is money to be saved. It sounds to me as though you seem very optimistic you'd have very little difficulty at all in finding the £12 billion that would be sufficient well, to no, cancel uh, the uh, NI rise, were uh, the Chancellor minded. <laughs> you'd better do a, a Rishi cast and find out what the Chancellor has to say about this. But can money be saved? Yes, of course it can. Um, one or two of, I don't say my colleagues, I mean, they're also your colleagues, are um, a bit less optimistic or at least impressed. So... Um, on our site, your colleague, uh, Lord Hannan, uh, wrote of the government document, The Benefit of Brexit. It was published you know, before you came along, of course. He said, overall, I'm afraid, uh, said Lord Hannan, the document is thin or watery, tasteless gruel, he said. Do you think Lord Hannan is wrong? Thin gruel is a great turn of phrase. Uh, I seem to remember using it once or twice myself. Um, there is much more to be done. It's, a, it's an uh, opening document. Uh, that predates me, but we've got to be uh, more ambitious in what we do. The, the, there are still lots of EU protocols that have got into people's minds that are still hanging around, and we need to remove those. And we need 
um, to do things that suit us rather than suit an international organization that we no longer belong to. And have we done all of that? No, not by, not by any means. Just on that very point, um, there's a fascination among some of my and your colleagues um, with employment law. And um, Lord Hallen wrote, BEIS, he said, has halted even the moderate plans to apply the working time directive in the more flexible way that several EU members do. Is this on your agenda? Well, I take this as a submission. I've received, I think, 1,600 submissions from Sun and Express readers as to what rules they would like removed. Um, and some of them want EU rules reimposed. But leaving aside those, I've received a large number uh, of suggestions, and Dan has made his suggestions too. And, you know, um, efficiency in labour markets is a key to economic success. There was a long history, wasn't there, under the major government of resistance to the Working Time Directive, if I remember rightly? Uh, there was, yes. Well, it, you, if you remember, it was a classic EU trick that uh, we'd opted out of the social chapter, so they brought it in under health and safety laws, which we didn't have an opt-out under. And this was one of the reasons many people like me thought the EU was an unsatisfactory body, because it didn't follow its own rules and uh, adjusted its rules uh, to try and centralise and to um, create the ever closer union that it set out in its um, preamble to its treaties. And when um, uh, Kwasi Kwasang replaced uh, Alok Sharma, it was claimed that the department had apparently been considering changes to the 48-hour weekly working limit and holiday pay entitlements. Is that on your agenda too? Well, everything that is an EU legacy rule is on my agenda. And if there's a good reason for changing it, it should be changed. Have submissions been made to you already about this? Well, we're taking Dan's as a submission. A holiday pay entitlement, I Nobody's, ra nobody's that. raised that. Um, but we had holiday pay entitlements before we were a member of the EU. So, so it, just because something had an EU rule doesn't necessarily mean it's EU in origin. The 48-hour rule is definitely an EU rule. But what are your uh, responsibilities in relation to the civil service? Let's just talk about the other side of what you're going to do. Well, civil service reform does come under my area and efficiency within the civil service. So what is this uh, about? And look, this is this is early days, but I had a very useful meeting with Francis Maud, who did it with great distinction and great success, actually saved many billions of pounds. What is this about? It's about specialisation. It's about um, ensuring that civil servants have the expertise and the skills that they need, um, rather than moving around every two years to a completely different department. Mm. There, there are some really strange structures within the civil service that have grown up for uh, things that seem like good arguments at the time. So different departments pay people different rates. But it may not be the most important department that pays the highest rate. So you may find that you get incentives to go to a department that doesn't necessarily need the most effective civil servants, and the only way you get a pay rise is by changing job. So as soon as you get to know how to do your job, you move. Can I read you um, a, a civil service detail? I stumbled across it last week when someone sent me Kate Bingham's remarks. Oh, yes, which I, I read. Thank you for putting that up, because that is excellent. And I circulated that to my office. I did see it at the time, but it had... And, this is why Conservative Home is so useful. How do we survive without Conservative Home putting these things up? Because I sent it to, to Fred and other members of the team. See, how would I survive without friends sending me the lectures? Someone did. I spotted it. I thought it was very interesting. Put it up, read it, thought about her ideas for reform, and then a little bell rang. And I realised that there was a certain overlap like, with a lecture Francis Maud had given. And then I looked again, and that also overlapped, looking forward to what Michael Gove said at Ditchley Park, and looking all the way back to what Tony Blair said in a lecture in 2004. So these are these are eternal themes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one striking detail was um, pointed out to me um, in a document by Ben Barnard of Policy Exchange about appointments. Um, and Barnard wrote that uh, vacancies within the top 200 civil service jobs do not go through the ordinary procedures for other vacancies in the senior civil service. They're instead reserved to a body called the Senior Leadership 
Committee of the Civil Service. Crucially, under the provisions of a protocol, this committee can authorise the appointment of a candidate, that's one of the top 200 jobs, without having to undertake a recruitment competition. Very few details about the senior leadership committee are publicly available. Does this strike you as satisfactory? And there is a new civil service commissioner in the form of um, Gisela Stewart, which I think is very good news. I think these things need to be opened up. And it's really important that people are able to apply for jobs, that they're advertised in a way that people can uh, understand, uh, and you can get people from outside coming in as well. It, it's, it, it mustn't be cliquey. It mustn't be um, an old boys network. It must be a properly competitive process to get the best people in. And actually, this is where the procurement side of the cabinet office has done very well. It's got in very capable people from outside. And then you need to look at um, how you structure this to get people in, say that they want to, so you normalize contracts. So it's certain, there's one of the criticisms has been of the um, uh, restrictions on people leaving the source service about what they can then do, that they don't know what they can or can't do. It goes to a committee and they only find out afterwards. Whereas if you're in business, you sign a contract and the contract says, when you leave, you can't work for a competitor for six months. It's clear. And if you want people to come in and out from business, you're going to have to be clear. You're not going to be able to say to them, well, we'll let you know two years after you left whether we think you were allowed to do that. Had you heard of this committee before coming here? No. Does it surprise you? That I hadn't heard of it before. I, had, no, the, the, I have heard of it in the last the, fortnight. Or that it exists um, in these terms. It does seem rather strange, doesn't it, that you know, perhaps this committee is genuinely finding the best candidates without any outside recruitment, but it does seem rather strange. It does seem it? rather strange, that's right. But this is where things are ripe for reform. And, and you go through the speeches, you go back to Tony Blair in 2004. Reform in this context is a constant effort because it is the nature of bureaucracies to get comfortable. How have you did? Because people move every two years. But if you go back 50 years, People got into a department and they stayed there for 40 years. Now, that wasn't brilliant either because you never got any new thinking and you always got people saying, well, we can't do that because we tried it in um, 1922 and it didn't work then and won't work now. So there isn't an answer that makes the civil service work for all time. You are constantly trying to improve and incentivize um, but I think transparency is always helpful. This showed up in the um, Bingham and Maud lectures in that Bingham's was a passionate plea for more people with scientific expertise. Mm, mm. When I read Maud's very close, was it, ah, what you really need is generalist people who can do a bit of everything. So you do get these different views. You need a bit of both because you need to evaluate expertise, don't you? And ministers, by their nature, end up being generalists because they have to evaluate the advice that is given to them by lots of other people who will be completely specialist in their field. Um, if you are specialist in a field, and that is all you're specialist in, I mean, it's maybe a very important thing to be specialist in, you cannot weigh up all the competing interests, objectives, risks, because you're completely focused on your area. So you need generalists who are able to evaluate broadly, but you need the best possible expertise. And do we need more scientists? Yes, I think we do, because uh, at ministerial level, let alone at um, civil service level, because we need people who understand the language of science. Just going from the very big to the particular, um, you responsible for um, how civil servants sign their emails? No, I'm not. <laughs> as far as I know, that's with Heather Wheeler, ah. <laughs> who is in charge of, um, uh, of civil service HR. So I think that is her responsibility. What, what do you think Heather Wheeler would think about civil servants appending their preferred pronouns to their email signatures? Um, well, we'd better ask her, but um, it's not something I choose to do personally. You're not a civil servant, of course. I, I'm no. not, but um, uh, am I... Do you think civil servants should? I'm a great believer in freedom of choice for people to 
decide what they want to do. I mean, if you want to put at the bottom how you, you know, um, that you should be addressed as your excellency in normal circumstances, that's up to you. I wouldn't choose to do it myself, and I certainly wouldn't enforce it on people, and I wouldn't expect them to do it. I'm just asking, this is another item that's emerged from Lord Hammond's column, but yeah. if I can give you another of your colleagues, another Conservative Lord, there was Lord Moore who objected to several permanent secretaries that he named Mr Slater at Education and Sir Stephen Lovegrove at Defence, putting out messages that were giving the hashtag for Black Lives Matter. Should permanent secretaries be doing Permanent that? secretaries should be completely apolitical. Which is not consistent with using a no, Black course Lives it, Matter course hashtag. No, they should be completely apolitical. Um, they, they, they can remember state events. They can remember um, Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday and the Queen's Jubilee. Just going back to the um, big picture again, what's your impression of how good the civil service is? When I was um, uh, looking up the assessments, there's one study in which the civil service genuinely is the best in the world. Uh, it's an Oxford study. According to the World Bank, um, the uh, civil service is 20th, and these are all figures that are about three years old. What's your impression? My impression of the people that I worked with in the leader's office and the people I've immediately started working with here is there are very, very good people uh, in the civil service that, um, who would I highlight? I would highlight in both cases the private offices who are hardworking and committed and are not looking at their clock saying it's time to go home. I would highlight um, APC, the Office of Parliamentary Council, which is absolutely remarkable because um, it manages to and this isn't just this government, but regularly provide answers for governments faster than anyone could reasonably be expected to do it. Um, and the Secretariat to, to PBL, which is the legislative arm of government, who make sure that the government has a full legislative programme of uh, well-constructed bills. And they work hard, they work long hours, um, they have emergencies to deal with, they are deeply committed and impressive. What I worry about... It's not that I've just gone completely native and, you know, been drinking the civil service Kool-Aid, um, whatever Kool-Aid is. I assume it's something like coolant for one's motor car, but perhaps it isn't. Um, uh, I'm afraid I'm not able to enlighten you on this point. Well, perhaps one of your readers will, readers and listeners will let us know. Um, but I don't think as a whole it delivers for the British people in the way that it should. And what, what do I mean by that? Um, that... I get too many constituents writing to me who are not getting the service from DVLA that they ought to be getting. I know their, passport, their, their driving licenses seem to be lost in a post room that is taking months to deal with. Um, I'm not sure, wandering around here, quite how many people are back at work yet. And I'm told certain figures, and then I wander around, and there seems to be a lot of empty desks. You're not um, in favour of civil servants continuing to work from home as a rule? There, there are some jobs that can be done from home, but actually I think there are an awful lot of jobs that need to be done in the office. You, you need that uh, creative discussion that um, helps people work. Just finally, what does success look like? Uh, we're here in a year's time, or maybe you're here with someone else having a different conversation. How would you measure success in your job? Success is are we contributing to the growth of the British economy? And that means by saving taxpayers' money so they have more of their own money to keep and making it easier for business by getting rid of unnecessary regulations. So success is the prosperity of the British people. And saying to ourselves, look, um, I don't think it's directly me, but there's a story in today's Daily Mail saying people are going to be fined £1,000 or have to pay a tax for £1,000 for driving into work and parking. The government should be saying to itself every day, how do we make our constituents' lives easier, not how do we make things nasty for them? And there are far too many things on statute book that make people's lives difficult. And my role is to try and weed these out wherever I can and wherever I have the authority to do it. It's why I've made this appeal to people to tell me what it is that is a burden for them. Because the government is not here to put burdens on people's backs. So I told you about this before. Do you remember, you're old enough to remember, in 1979, the party political broadcast that we had, I seem to remember, of a runner on the racetrack. And somebody comes out and puts a weight round his neck. GB's in the front, we have a Union Jack on. And we're out in front, and a chap comes out and puts a big weight round his neck, and then another one, and then another one. And we then fall behind all these other countries in the race. And 
what Margaret Thatcher did was take these weights off people's necks. And we should be doing exactly the same. That's what success is. Is there a demonstrable savings figure that you'd be looking at that would be new savings, not um, savings that were already being made or in the course of being made before you were appointed? I don't think there is a single figure. Um, I wish there were, because it would be um, demonstrable. And I could say to Neo, we've saved X billion. Uh, I think it is about getting all the fruits of savings rather than saying, well, we can, you know, invent this figure here, here and there. It needs to be real efficiency within the economy that is taking burdens off people, which is probably hard to measure financially. It's like, it's like all those figures you see, all those forecasts on how beneficial trade uh, agreements will be. Every single trade agreement that I know of has exceeded its forecast saving by miles. You talk to um, uh, um, Alexander Downer, um, who I'm sure you know, great man, uh, and the success of the trade deals that were done by Australia when he was Foreign Secretary, and the contribution it made to the Australian economy, and the forecasts were trivial. So I think it's that type of thing. I, th I, th you know, I think um, a little leaven leavens all the bread. Well, from bread to uh, water, we've no more than dipped our toe into the great ocean in which you are now swimming. Um, but I'm sure the Mulcast will be back in a fortnight to explore it further. Jacob rees thank you very much. Paul, as always, thank you. The Mulcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob rees about the topics of the day.